Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation about an improved multi-model formulation of the wave propagation in a 3D wave guide. I'm Thomas Gunock, a PhD student in Le Mans University, and my supervisors are Simon Félix and Jean-Baptiste Doc. First of all, why do we study guided waves in acoustics? We do so because there are plenty of applications that go from wind instruments in musical acoustics to horns of horn loudspeakers in audio engineering to engine in aeronautics, etc. Note that in the following we only consider waveguides with a circular cross-section, so typically this can be the trumpet on the left, but not the horn loudspeaker on the right. There are many ways of solving a guided wave problem, and we are mainly going to make the distinction between the analytical methods and the numerical methods. In the one hand, the analytical methods always rely on strong assumptions on the geometry, and also sometimes on the frequency. Thus, they are not really useful to study complex shape with guide. On the other hand, the classical numerical methods such as the FAM or the BEM are not very suited to the study of guided waves. I mean, of course, they can provide good results, but they do not make advantage of the main property of guided waves, that is, having a preferred direction of propagation. So this is why a multimodal method has been developed for now more than 40 years uh, to provide a better alternative to those classical me numerical methods. Indeed, it shows numerous benefits, as for example, it provides a direct access to the relevant physical quantities, such as the end impedances, and plus um, the meshing of the geometry is extremely simple. The structure of the presentation will be as follows. First, we give an overview of the standard multimodal method and we explain why it needs to be improved. So, in a second time, we can better explain what is exactly the improved method. And finally, we compare the results provided by both the standard and the improved method. As I mentioned earlier, we consider 3D waveguides with a circular cross section. As you can see, the radius of the cross section can change along the longitudinal axis. And speaking of the longitudinal axis, we ignore the waveguide distortion, so it is included in the plane. We don't consider any damping or nonlinear effects, so the pressure field inside that waveguide must simply satisfy the classical Helmholtz equation. In this study, we impose a hard wall boundary condition at the border, but the multimodal method is perfectly able to handle other boundary conditions. Now we are going to transform this equation into the model wave equation that is central to the multimodal method. To this end, we need to define a flow variable, or more precisely, a variable analogous to the flow here it is denoted Q. Also, we express P and Q as combinations of transverse functions whose amplitudes changes over X, and we put all those amplitudes in model vectors. Finally, we can project the whole problem onto the set of transverse functions, which yields the model wave equation, which is a 1D equation. The M matrix you see is a matrix that depends on x and that is affected by the choice of the transverse functions and of the frequency. Thanks to this model wave equation and the input-output conditions, we can entirely solve the problem. Now let's go back a little bit and focus on those transverse functions. For any given wall radius, the transverse functions are chosen to be the modes of the local circular cross-section, ignoring the derivative of the radius along x. A number of you might already know about such modes, they are the Bessel functions expanded such that the boundary condition is satisfied. 
a key point is they are distributed in azimuthal orders that we do not mu. Those azimuthal orders express the theta dependence, as we can see with those lobes, where the function value is either positive or negative. This way of choosing the modes dates back to the origins of the method when the waveguide was discretized as an assembly of very short cylinders. But since the work of Pagneux in the 90s, we consider the continuous variations of the radius, which highlights an issue. This issue is that if we combine the separation of variables and the mode's behavior at the boundary, we find out that the pressure field can never truly satisfy the boundary condition with a finite number of modes. And numerically, the number of modes is always finite. Indeed, a combination of straight modes will always give a pressure gradient that is normal to the radial direction. But in a variable radius waveguide, the radial direction is not the normal direction, which determines the true boundary condition. This phenomenon is responsible for a slow convergence of the method, but we explain in the next section how it can be overcome. First, let us consider an axisymmetric geometry and let us focus on a single azimuthal order, so the problem becomes to the like. For example, we take the first azimuthal order. Note that the improved method in 2D Cartesian coordinates has already been described, so this first axisymmetric case only surpasses uh, the literature a little bit. The biggest progress will be discussed later in the presentation. As we said in the previous section, using the standard basis yields a pressure gradient at the border that is necessarily normal to the wrong direction. So the core idea of the improved method is quite simple. It relies on adding a transverse function with another boundary condition, so a combination of transverse functions can possibly satisfy the exact boundary condition. OK, we must add a mode with a boundary condition that differs from the others, but this doesn't tell us what mode should we add. So to lead us toward an answer, we consider the following condition. Adding the mode must preserve the uncoupled behavior in the straight parts of the waveguide. This is achieved by taking the same kind of straight mode than before, but with a directly boundary condition instead of a Neumann one. Then this mode must be orthogonalized with the other modes, which finally gives us the supplementary mode. Here you can see for a total number of five modes, the axisymmetric supplementary mode among the others. At the right of the graph, you can see that all the modes satisfy the same boundary condition, except the supplementary mode. As I said earlier, the axisymmetric case is pretty close to the existing 2D literature, so let us go one true step further with a curved geometry. Now, all the azimuthal orders theoretically have to be considered as they are coupled, improving Improving the method now means we must add a supplementary mode of each of the azimuthal orders, following the same step than before. As we experimented it, it is pointless to improve some azimuthal orders only, because at some point we lose the improved convergence. In the following section, we will speak of standard basis and improved basis to indicate whether we include supplementary modes or not. First, we investigate the axisymmetric case, as it allows to focus on a single azimuthal order. That is, because coupling between azimuthal orders only occurs when there is some curvature, as we said. Let us have a look at the pressure field for this geometry 
and for an azimuthal order equal to 1. It is terminated on the right with an infinite cylinder radiation condition and it is excited with a pressure condition on the left. Let us focus now on the isobars for a given pressure. Here the black isobars represent the isobars of the exact solution, that is, a solution computed with a large number of modes. And you can see with the colored isobars that increasing the number of modes from 2 to 4 brings us closer to the solution. But if we zoom in on the boundary, we can see that the boundary condition is poorly satisfied with four modes of the standard basis, while it is much better satisfied with four modes of the improved basis. And this has a significant impact on the convergence, as we can see here on this graph representing the error on the pressure field on the left and the error on the input reflection coefficient against the number of modes on the right. If you wonder, the error on the pressure field is obtained by integrating the absolute difference between the pressure field with few modes and the reference pressure field. Same thing with curved waveguides as, again, the errors decreases significantly faster when using the improved basis. The main difference here is we observe a staircase shape because we select the modes using the increasing order of their cutoff frequency. But in 3D, this is not necessarily the best order. Indeed, some asymptotal orders contribute more to the solution than from others, like the second asymptotal order, mu equal 1, in that case. That said, knowing the best sequencing of the mode would require a prior investigation of the problem. That's why we stick to the classical way of picking modes. Last but not least, we focus on a more practical illustration of the role of the supplementary mode. Indeed, we look at the input impedance that is computed with either the standard or the improved basis. As a reminder, the input impedance is often used to characterize the resonance frequencies of a wind instrument, so this is an interesting quality to look at. If we zoom in off on the first peak of the input impedance modulus, we can see that the improved basis is closer to the solution with, with only 6 modes than the standard basis with 50 modes, which is quite huge. To conclude, let us emphasize that the improved method can highly reduce CD computation costs in practice, which is of fundamental importance if one wishes to apply the multimodal method to, for example, shape optimization. Thank you for listening.